So it is seven o'clock. Um, I am gonna call this Board of Town Commissioners work session to order. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Absolutely. Uh, President Sarah Franklin. Here. Uh, Commissioner Jan Stuckett. Here. Commissioner Thomas Hanchett. Here. Commissioner Karen Lott. Here. Uh, Deputy Clerk Lucy Wade. Here. And Chief of Police David Burse. Here. And call sign our town administrator, all elected members present. Okay. Let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, do I have a consent to the agenda? I consent to the agenda. Okay, hearing no objections and consent, we'll move forward with business. I know that Commissioner Lott has, um, is, is here to vote and she is going to need to leave early. So let's get right into it. Um, Kyle, do you wanna give us a overview? Absolutely. Um, so we have uh, just about the final version of the community garden shared use agreement between the town and Providence St. John Baptist Church. Uh, for the Green Teams Community Garden located at 5607 Old Crane Highway. Um, I won't go into the whole thing, but pretty much uh, shows what the town is going to be responsible for and what the church is responsible for. Um, and it's a annual um, agreement, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, so it's an, I kind of was the secretary to uh, the green team members and the church were all on a call together and they were telling me what changes they wanted and I was typing it. So it's, it is, it does renew annually um, automatically unless someone else cancels it. It does include a provision so that if the church canceled it, then the town would still have access to the property for the growing season. Um, it does have a provision if the town cancels it that we'll still mow it for the rest of that growing season. So the garden itself is maintained. Um, and it has like liability-ish things in there that, um, that Kevin made sure were in there, our lawyer, and, um, and make sure that everyone's acting lawful, lawfully at all times. Um, and we'll carry insurance on it. So I guess, do the commissioners have any questions? Not at this time. Okay, I have um, a written public comment that I am going to read in here uh, so that it can be made part of the record. And I, you probably can't see me right now, but I am still here. Okay, so with regard to this particular topic, uh, Ms. Patty Caldicott asked, um, she didn't see the map in the, attend in the ex exhibit one. Um, and she was wondering where that was. I know often the exhibits aren't included, so that's probably something we'll need to work on. Um, what's the impact to public works? Who pays for the plants? Who waters the garden? How is this being advertised to the town? What are the hours? Who pays and paid for the maintenance? And is there a budget item to accommodate this understanding? Um, so I'm just gonna, go through and say, you know, it's minimal impact on public works. They're just coming once a week. Um, everything is, everything else is done through the green team and the green team's bylaws, which um, they will be establishing. So what we're doing is we're establishing this agreement now because there are ground bees and those ground bees will attack our volunteers and they will attack our staff if we do not get the brush mowed down initially while it is still cold. 
So we're adopting this so that we can go ahead and mow, um, but they won't be able to implement, the, like the, the green team is gonna have bylaws for the garden. They're gonna have hours for the garden. All that stuff needs to be worked up for, with the church. The issue right now is simply an agreement that allows our staff to go on site and make the, sa the lot safe for volunteers. So I will move on to any other public comment. And if any uh, public have comment, you just click the raise hand feature. Thank you, Kyle. Give them a minute if they need it. Is there any other, are there any hands coming up? No hands, okay. All right. Um, having no further public comment and no further commissioner comment, do I have a motion to approve the community garden shared use agreement? I so move. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor, starting with Janice. Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Okay. Um, so we can move on to structure of government and Karen, whenever you need to leave, you can sneak out because we will still have a quorum. So thank you. <laughs> um, so this part of the agenda is really the first time thank we're you. actually, thank you. This is the first time we're talking about this in a public forum. We've alluded to the fact that we're gonna have five commissioners and that means changes need to be made. Um, I know I've heard comments from residents wanting to see things maybe done a little differently. So we are opening the discussion with commissioners and residents on how our government is structured. And this is sort of an outline of the topics that we will be discussing. Um, so what I was hoping we would do today <laughs> is First, kind of give the public their first chance to say, hey, I'd like more information on X, Y, or Z. Um, and also talk about how we might engage the public on that. this. So what I would like to see us do is a combination of outreach. So some survey monkeys, um, some outreach at community events like Marlboro Day, uh, obviously discussions at these work sessions, but maybe also uh, a few special like Saturday sessions uh, or something at a different time so that residents who can't come to these normal sessions could come to a special session to talk about what they'd like to see um, from their structure of government. So I'm wondering what other commissioners think, what other ideas you got, all have. Um, yeah, I think I like this uh, for sure. The survey monkey, I believe everyone wants to. We want to make sure that everyone has a real opportunity to join in these discussions. And um, it's been very difficult, we know, with COVID. So um, if we start possibly with, with the survey monkey to put out a few of those ideas and find out which one's best work um, for the residents, I think that's a great start. So um, all those things that you mentioned, I think, are viable options and it's th something that we need to explore. I agree. Um, my one question is, is uh, can we make sure that it's at least two, three weeks notice? And that's my two, only comment. Two, three weeks notice for? Um, any special meetings. Oh, yes, definitely, because we'd want the public to plan for it. Right, yeah, so that's all. That's my only comment. Thank you. So the feedback I just heard was that we should start with a survey monkey and then go from there with more public outreach as we have more of those details input. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I guess we're gonna take some public comment on this. Uh, but initially, what I'm thinking is we're going to have staff um, develop a survey monkey for us to review at either the next work session or the next meeting. 
So let's move to public comment. If anyone has a comment, if you can put your hand in the air and Kyle will unmute you. Is there anyone, Kyle? No, no one. Okay, well, this is the first of many chances to participate in this. Um, and if anyone sees this after the fact and has questions, just email us at info at uppermurbermd.com so we can, or gov, so we can get that out to you. We're going to move on to our next agenda item. Sorry, which Mayor, would, is, would uh, oh. the board like to see the Survey Monkey uh, at a future work session? March, April? Let's try to get it either the... Mark, I mean, it would be better at a work session because, mm -hmm. you know, it won't take up time at a meeting, but if we can, if we can't get it by the March work session then by the March town meeting, mm -hmm. I, I'd kind of like the board to be able to see it and review it in case we missed anything and the public can have a chance to say if they feel anything's missing. Absolutely. Sorry, so now we'll move on to the committee bylaws. Um, and I, I'm doing a lot of talking because John's not here. I know Kyle, you can do some of it, but basically um, we have a whole bunch of committees that are doing great work <laughs> and they need to have adopted bylaws. Uh, only two of our committees have adopted bylaws as far as if, if I have that correct, Kyle can correct me if I'm wrong. And um, those, so what I wanted to do was get all these bylaws in front of us so that we can finally approve them. I know events has had bylaws waiting to be approved for years. Um, so I wanna know what you guys think when you review them, but I wanna have a, a general thing is that because these bylaws were all written, before, for, or for the most part, we're in before COVID, they do not include a provision to have virtual meetings. So I was going to ask all of the committees to please include that uh, before we approve them. I have a few more specific ones based on like individual committees, but I just wanted to give uh, the other commissioners a chance to share comments before I go into the weeds. <laughs> okay, so I'll go a little bit into the weeds. Uh, I was going, uh, when I reviewed the green teams bylaws, which they drafted a while back, um, I noticed that they have their, uh, members being appointed in December of every even numbered year, which would put us not appointing their folks until the end of this year. So I was gonna recommend they move that date forward. Um, then looking at the sustainable working group bylaws, um, and this is actually something that I noticed in not only the sustainable working group bylaws, but also in the um, historic committee bylaws, there are these residency requirements um, where like in sustainable working group, it's uh, the chairperson needs to be a town resident. And in the historic committees, it's that there's seven members and four of them need to be um, town residents. And I noticed when historic uh, Janice, you may remember, came to us to re-nominate their members that they struggled to find seven people because they have seven rather than three like all the other ones do. Um, but they also struggled to find town residents. And I think that's true. A lot of the committees struggle to find town residents because the town is so small. So what I hear from our committees and our residents is that you know, it should be open to the people who want to do the work. That, those are my thoughts on that. Um, and then um, just with regard to the events committee, um, they process their expenditures 
with their treasurer through the board and the president, which is me, but I think they should process them through that treasurer, Janice, or that role, um, because we're trying to expand that role a bit. Those are all my comments. Does anyone else have comments from the board before we go to public comment? Um, no, I, I thank you that you did bring up the fact that we know that there are a lot of um, some committees that are struggling, I would say, uh, to find uh, participants. And so this is really important to see if there's anything that we can flush out that may be able to help um, the, the committees bring either bring on or somehow find some way to streamline. Maybe I don't know there's a requirement, um, some things that we can look into. Um, and uh, with their input, of course, to see if we can bring in more um, volunteers. Right now, it's pretty tough to get volunteers to do, um, to, to participate, but um, hopefully we'll be able to find and uh, collaborate with uh, the heads of the committees to find out what works best. And um, I have some good ideas. I guess once we get there, at least uh, we can talk a little bit more about those, but yes. Okay, did, sorry, did you have suggestions specifically about the bylaws or about recruiting volunteers? Um, just specifically about recruiting volunteers. Okay. Maybe if we're able to um, provide some, um, maybe just even, I know that we put this out a call previously, mm -hmm. Um, in our constant contact, I think that we need to probably be a little bit more, um, you make that a little bit more useful for us, um, with the constant contacts. And then mm -hmm. the time that we have an event that we are actually actively recruiting or the committees are there to actively recruit. So even if it's an art council, if it's an art you know, event or the um, events team, like, uh, it would be good if the committee were out actively uh, trying to recruit during those major events. I agree. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very helpful. And just, you know, we, I know we have tables set up sometimes, but a lot of times uh, residents, they may not stop by that particular table. I think we just need to be visible and actually chatting and finding out what uh, folks are interested in and then have that information ready and the person, uh, the contact information for whomever they could reach out to. So it's about just being ready and having those conversations and showing up for public events. And I think that that will help us draw more volunteers. I agree. And I actually, while you're talking, I was thinking maybe we could have like a little half page form that what like we just care keep around with us so like we meet someone and they're interested in volunteering and we're like here fill this out right now <laughs> and then we'll email you um that way they don't have to take an action um, that may help oh yeah absolutely um tommy do you have any thoughts yeah my only thought was just um not advertising, but putting it out, a, fly, a mail or something maybe, or I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't have much, I haven't thought about it enough to know exactly what else we could do. Okay. And you know, I, I just thought about something. If we were able to pot, uh, have like an iPad on site, so instead of mm -hmm. like expecting, them to feel that, you know, to get back to yes. us, let's have like an, let's have an iPad available so that we can take their information at. We could have it on our iPad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, then that's a good idea. Well, we have our iPads, but I'm saying the committees that had committees that um, when they're there, that if we have mm -hmm. something available for uh, the, the committee heads to bring them mm -hmm. to the to actually put in their information. That way we're not losing anything and we're keeping track of all of the data and able to yeah. market, market back out to our volunteers. Yeah, that's a good idea. We could have, we could even have like, cause each commissioner has a committee, though some committees 
don't have commissioners right now and we need to fix that, but um, it could be that um, the commissioner whose committee it is kind of brings their iPad for that use that day. Um, yeah, we'll have to work that out. Details. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So what, we don't what need committee? Details right now. Um, we, what well, so we need to, so sorry, Tommy. So we have, um, we have to review the committees. I have two committees um, and Janice has one committee and then there's two committees, sustainable working group and um, historic that don't have uh, commissioners and cert doesn't have a commissioner though it hasn't generally have one. Um, so but I was kind of thinking we would wait till the election is over tonight and we know who's coming on and then we can, the okay. five of us work that out. Um, um, both of those actually sound feasible for me. Um, so what are the, the, the short people on the board, these committees? No, um, the committees just have a commissioner liaison and Linda mm -hmm. was the commissioner liaison for those two. Okay. So we need to just work that out. Um, All right, I'll find out more about that with you guys. Sounds good. So we'll we'll talk more about that in detail. Um, I want to go to resident comment, and I will read in the resident comment from Patty Caldicott, and that is none of these bylaws, with the exception of CERT, have been approved. Although the committees have been functioning for over three years. Nowhere in the bylaws does it state that the majority of the board members should reside within the town limits. I believe this is essential to ensure that the committee is committed and executing actions, events by, for the town, by members residing within the town. Town funding without approved bylaws. So those are those comments. Um, I think we've kind of talked about them a bit. But one of the reasons I want the bylaws in place is because we're about to fund these committees again. And I agree, they need to be in place before we fund them. Kyle, do we have any hands raised? Yep, Brian Calicott has his hand okay. raised. So. There you go, Brian, you should be on now. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes, yeah. we can. So, yeah, I think it's a, actually a pretty good idea to have non-residents on committee boards. I mean, effectively, You'll have the commissioners getting some approval capability, at least in the bylaws, as I've read them. So, you know, Tom Cavanaugh, for example, he's participated in the majority of our events for years. He lives about two miles outside of town. He's done almost all the 1814 more of uh, 1812 work. So I can see that, even though Patty may not have a perfect agreement with me. I think we're good there. Um, I do want to mention, though, the boilerplate or template may be necessary for the COVID stuff. You don't want like just everyone going out and writing their own thing. And I think it would be best if someone supplied some, hey, uniformity wise, what do we need for all of our committees? And instead of having everyone go out and try to figure it out on their own, that's all I have. Okay, I hope you're not in too much trouble and I will um, work with town staff to, basically we'll send a memo to each committee about the virtual stuff and we'll provide them with some boilerplate plate language they can use. Anyone else? I have a question. Do, do you all have the CERT bylaws? Yes, I do. Okay. Because I think in there, they, they established where theirs is already have online, especially at town hall is not available. So I just want to make sure you had it. All right. I don't remember seeing that, but I may have um, like assumed something should have been one place where it wasn't. So I'll read them again. Hey, I just looked at it. So it has in there about me. It's under meetings that they will do them online if town hall is not available. So they, they don't use the word virtual, but they'll say they said online, which was done in October. So. Okay, so right. then, oh, yeah, I see that. So they probably they don't need a, a note from us. So they're good. And we can probably use their language. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, the arts council met last night and we talked about bylaws. So I hope they're going to get some drafts together to email out themselves. And once they have a say, they'll send it over to the town. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to just, I know we're going to be waiting for theirs a little bit, but I would like to try and move forward. And even if we approve, 
these without the arts and we have to approve the arts later. I just don't want it. I mean, events has spent three years waiting for their bylaws to be approved. So I don't want that to happen. Um, is there any more resident comment? Uh, nope, not as of right now. All right, let us then move on to the annexation plan. I'm gonna let Kyle talk about this, but I want to be very, very clear. This was us sitting down and being like, hmm, what are we gonna do next with annexation? Let's start somewhere. And I brought out a colored pencil and started to draw some lines. These are not final lines. <laughs> These are not how it's going to turn out. These are just a place for us to start talking. I'll turn it over to you now, Kyle. <laughs> Absolutely. As the mayor mentioned, this is just like some rough starting points based on some discussions that the town has had, um, kind of a mix of what makes sense and discussions the town has had with some property owners in these areas. Let me go to the bigger map on your screen. Um, so as you can see, it, it's kind of rough. Uh, you can see the, the current town limits with the, the annexation phase two and three in place, um, which should be finalized. Oh, that's a whole different topic um, for discussion. Um, but you can see we're filling in some of the gaps that the county uh, recommended bringing in the remainder of Peerless to the north, which may include um, the lower part of Balmoral there. And that comes over, you can see it attaches to uh, Chelsea Lane, um, to the south, kind of the industrial hub, industrial commercial hub right there at 301 at Route 4. Um, and down, it brings in the railroad tracks and pretty much falls 301 down to uh, Old Crane Highway. Um, and brings in all these kind of properties along Old Crane Highway and the HOAs that are back in there as well, um, which we've had some discussions with some property owners on those sides. And then um, to the north, um, some of the initial areas we had in annexation, especially off uh, Old Marlboro Pike there between the auto body shop and um, the CVS. Um, and you can just see uh, north up uh, 202, some more discussions with some people up 202 and how that has to kind of carry over to the villages. Um, so this is just a, a very rough outline um, uh, of any, any future areas and it's five, 10 years plan, obviously build for services, but I'll turn over to the commissioners for discussion. So Kyle and I have talked about this a ton. Um, <laughs> and I know that we're gonna need to talk um, in more detail, get feedback from Chief and Darnell as we are going along, because we need to make sure we're not bringing in more than we can serve at one time. But I want the commissioners to, since you weren't sitting in a room with a pencil with us, have a chance to, uh, say what things are and maybe Kyle, if you can kind of put your cursor over the areas and like highlight, like here's the Amish market and oh, okay, sure. here's Home Depot and that kind of thing. So people can yeah, orient a little. Actually, I can start drawing on this. Um, um, this is Commissioner Duckett. So um, thank you for this. And my thoughts are, um, I mean, I don't see that it's, it's a bad start. I will say it's not a bad start. And simply because, especially knowing that in area C there, which um, what I understand is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle or Mayor, uh, villages, the villages and the jail area. So like some of Brown Station Road, uh, the Amish market, is that correct? You got it. Yep. Okay. Correct. And with that being the case, I mean, that seems like a natural um, progression for us first, at least the way that I see it, um, simply because I recall in our previous, uh, like last year, Senator Peters mentioned um, mm -hmm. that this is one of the areas that he felt most that we should be focusing on annexing uh, mm -hmm. through too. So um, I think it's, it's, it's important if he was behind it and he was suggesting it, I think this is probably, this is our next, one of our next big move, moves at least. Um, I'm not sure if we could 
uh, readjust or look at the how we have it structured. I'm not sure if A is going to be the next step or if B. So is this in a some no? Order? The letters were there to avoid order, but I guess letters have order too. I I was thinking about symbols, but I thought that would be too weird. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. no order, just okay. just through letters on the map. Um, okay, I think once we, we, we have a better understanding, maybe a, a, the, finding the order to this might be really helpful so that we know which direction we're going to next. Um, but I would say for me, I know that that seems like a natural progression into that area. Um, and um, with all of the residents, and I believe that this area is very interested in coming in as well. Um, and simply because again, Senator Peters, pushed us in that direction. And he said that we should have annexed or at least worked on annexing this area a long time ago. So with that and the support that uh, they were willing to provide, I think it's just natural that we at least look into that. And of course, yes, we, we wanna hear what the residents think, but just so the residents are aware and understand that this is an area that we have support in if we are wanting to move in that direction. So um, there's more, of course, I see here. And um, some of those areas are gonna be some, some hefty areas to tackle, but I think whatever is most natural for us and what most, makes most sense is what we need to be doing next. That's all I have to say at this point, right at this time. I agree okay. with everything Janet, Janet just said. Um, natural progression was a good term. Um, I think it's, uh, I need to learn a little more. I, what's the next step? Do you bail out letters or? So I think um, I was kind of going to summer do the, do the thing my husband does when he's running therapy groups is what I'm hearing is, <laughs> um, so what I'm hearing is um, that we want to make natural progressions sort of outward from the direction that we're in. And um, we want to make sure that the community that we're annexing is ready to come in. And we want to know what their interest level is. So I think it might be a good idea to kind of target almost all of these areas around us with some initial mailings and say like mm -hmm. interested in annexation, and like see what feedback we get so that we almost kind of know where we're gonna, like if one community, nobody seems interested, right? And we get no responses and another community, we get like 75% of the people responding, then it makes sense to go in that direction. That's that my- good. Get a feel for it and start there wherever. The, uh, the most support is. Um, something that I think in, that we had um, so that we had to go out in the constant contact and I think Kyle had put this together or John, but it was it was pretty, uh, pretty informative and I really uh, liked seeing it and it was during the snow time when it pointed out or highlighted um, who's plowing your streets. So I thought that was very creative. So it's important that these areas know what we can do for them and how we can support them and start them to thinking about who's doing those things for them now and how it could be much better in the future. So of course, I'm, I'm definitely interested in what um, our um, operations uh, would uh, Mr. Barnes has to say and what she thinks about that um, as well, um, making sure that this is, you know, a good next step for us, you know, because I know that that the manpower needs to be there to be able to support that. And of course, we're growing out our police department. So that's a step. Um, but in addition to that, we want to make sure that uh, facilities wise, we're able to manage all that we're going to be taking on in the future. So um, yeah, um, I, I think that was some creative marketing there, Kyle or John. And if we, when we send this information out, I, I think that that would be a great start to have them start thinking about 
what is being done and who's supporting their community and how can they get there and what we can specifically do for them. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that would be helpful to, to the folks that we're trying to attract. Show them how it'll be good for them. Yeah, I kind of started or beneficial of like, an, what can annexation do for you? But um, yeah. I need to say that. And then I'll, of course I'll send, you know, you guys know that I send stuff through you. So, you know, you'll see it and have a chance. Um, <laughs> take a look at it. Um, all right, should we move on to public comment? Uh, I, I have public comment that was written in from Patty Calicott, but it is related to the current annexation. So I'm gonna ask for public comment at the from the meeting members before I read it. We do have uh, one, Brian Calicott. Brian, okay. you're on. My, um, there you go, volume up. Um, <laughs> thanks a bunch. Uh, just a couple questions. What is the primary driver for the town behind the growth? I'm talking this future phase three and four or whatever you wanna call them. Um, is it for future controlled or worried about other municipalities like Bowie driving into us? I mean, it really shouldn't be about tax base increase because a municipality offers uh, services for taxes. It doesn't make money. It's not intended to at least. What are your thoughts on that? So, so I will say um, that the town's kind of failure to grow in the past has created situations outside of town that affect us and we are not able to address them because they're not part of our town. So we need to be able to have more power to address situations. We also need more base to um, be able to bring in more money, not just tax based money, but you know, there's Grant grants. money available. Yeah. There's yeah, there's a lot of grants available that we don't we can't apply for. A lot of services we can't receive, um, and and we have a lot of people saying, like, yeah, there's there's people who are like, well, maybe you know, we want to be in a municipality, and you know, how far are we gonna have Bowie come down? That is a that is a point you make um, that I hadn't really thought too much about. But I, I think also for me as a planner. Um, being able to create networks, um, especially like trail networks and pathways and green spaces um, and parks and that kind of thing, you need the area to plan that. Um, and so a lot of the amenities I think our residents want aren't available because we are so small. Uh, thanks. I, I guess I probably don't get a follow-up, but I would at least like to think that we'd want a year under our belt under a, a annexation like phase two, three before we go forward with something else. How do you know lessons learned? How do you know if you're growing too fast and don't have growing pains and unintended consequences? If you've never done it before and then you just go out there and keep on going as fast as you can, you may not be able to accommodate all of the citizens needs. Yeah, we don't have our timer today because that's a John thing. So I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> I, I can take this offline. I apologize. But that's fine. That's fine. No, that's fine. Um, we'll be, I'll try to get one up, but um, I'm going to. Well, may I take that, uh, Mayor? I, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I would like to address that. I mean, we, um, I did mention that this is when you, when you talk about growing too quickly, and I totally understand that. And that's um, why I mentioned having this conversation, a broader conversation with our police chief, as well as um, Mr. Uh, Bond to find out like, and to find out what their thoughts are on us being able to accommodate these specific areas. So it's not something that we're doing just uh, with a half thought. We're really putting a lot of thought into this and we're making sure that we're not biting off, should I say more than we can chew. So this is just, uh, this is preliminary discussions. It's, it's just getting us started, but we will make sure that once these things are moving forward, that this is something that we can truly accommodate. 
So we don't want to put the, our town in a bad situation. We want to make sure that we're able to follow through on our promises and, um, and, and we'll do that. So, but, but thank you, that, that was a good point raised, but I just wanna make sure that I restate um, that to let you know that we would never move ahead rashly without making sure that it is a good fit for the town and that we're viable and able to support all of the needs of our additional residents. Wow, thank you, Commissioner Duckett. I, I feel better. I'll, I'll be looking at the cost benefit along with you guys at some point or another then, thanks. Um, yeah, I want to move on to the other resident comment that was written in, and I just want to, um, I want to clarify again something, and I'll probably have to say this a lot because it's not necessarily how things have been done in the past, but it's really important to this board that the public have an opportunity to participate in the discussion early and often. Um, so that's why we're talking about this now. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to, um, do the public comment from Patty Caldecott, um, which was, why was the annexation delayed and placed on hold? How long will the annexation be on hold? And what is the impact on the next budget? And I know everyone is wondering this question, um, so I'm going to answer it. Uh, the annexation has been placed on hold because we have received a petition for referendum. Before that can move forward, I have to be able to verify that everyone who signed that petition is actually qualified to do so. Um, and I am advised by the attorney that I need roles to do that. And I also need data to do that. So I am collecting the data and establishing the roles with the advice of the attorney. Um, and when that kind of comes out, you know, just keep an eye out and you'll see all that come out as we move forward. But in the meantime, we are on hold. We are in a legal limbo and we cannot provide services to those areas. Okay. Um, was were there any other public with comments, Kyle? Nope. All right. Uh, next item is FY twenty three budget. We have Will here. Yeah, I'm sure. Are you there, Will? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I don't know if you welcome to see me, but I'm here. We can hear you. Take it away. Oh, okay. Sorry, I apologize. So, um, so right here we're talking about uh, the board. This well, this is a board discussion for the FY 2023 uh, budget. Uh, a few things that is within this um, that we think may be uh, key points of FY 2023 is, uh, of course, just having a sustainable government. Um, and really, you know, honestly, Kyle was one of the ones that put some of these things together. So honestly, I probably will pass it off to Kyle uh, to talk more about these types of things. Um, Kyle, do you want to pitch in on this one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we just put on here the uh, the goals that the board selected for the their term in office, sustainable government, expand town boundaries, flame mitigation safety, safe and modern roadways, and uh, increased recreation opportunities. Um, because budgets are planning documents and that's how you achieve goals. Um, some stuff can be done without money, but a lot of it, it, it takes money. Um, so a, a, a budget is really the, pretty much setting the goals of, of the board, um, what projects you want to see and initiatives you want to push and fund. Um, so that's why we just wanted to bring up those, those items. And let, and, yep. And, I, and what I'll add is how this can most certainly affect the budget and how it has affected a budget in the last most certainly the, the years, last two or three years, is by a lot of grant opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, as you talk about the uh, recreation opportunities with the, the playground that we've done, what that is pretty much almost 100% funded. It's not 100% funded, but it's close to it. Um, talking about how we use our uh, uh, highway user revenue as far as road improvements and things like that. So I think it's more so making sure that uh, the things that we input within the budget um, and some of the goals that we're looking to do within the next year or two and, uh, that we look on a state and federal level for those grants, they continue to supplement the budget in many ways, but to increase those visible improvements throughout the uh, community as well. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, so I think one of, you know, kind of one of the things you guys said to us was if we have one or two major goals or priorities for this fiscal year to kind of bring them 
And I will say that my two goals that I wrote down were roads and recreation. I don't know if anyone else had anything to add. Well, of course, roadways, um, because of course we know we need those areas addressed um, significantly. I mean, we know that this is long overdue. So roads for sure and um, the flooding mitigation um, of the roadways. So um, we all know we pass by the area like right in front of the bank. Uh, was that Church Street? Am I off? But anyway, the areas that need those uh, sonar Raiders, uh, re, uh, radars mm -hmm. help us determine uh, some of this uh, flooding and, and things of that nature. So I think the town of Upper Marble is so well overdue for road paving and improvements and, um, and all of those things. So this is very important for our next, next budget, uh, for our upcoming budget discussions. I think Kyle, maybe one thing, and I know they've been doing over the last few meetings, but um, as we get closer to the end of the first quarter of this calendar year, if we get more updates on the infrastructure bill um, and mm -hmm. what that's going to look like for us all, um, such as those road improvements and uh, 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 stormwater improvements and things like that. So pretty much I was, I was thinking of green wheel, but I know they've spoke about that in a few of the meetings that we've had over the last month or so. Yeah, and I found a document on that will too um, to review. We will be definitely looking for creative funding sources. And Kyle got some really good feedback from me to hunt already on funding sources. Right, Kyle? Yep, yep that's correct. So when Darnell and I met with them, they had a, a bunch of ideas on how to get some funding sources at the, the state and federal levels. And then also, um, they actually have a grant writer on staff. I didn't know this until Darnell and I had our onboarding. They have an on-staff person who does all their grants for like the Clean Water Partnership and stuff. And they really help fund these projects um, because I think what they've said is they see a lot of times projects get cut back because of funding. So they try to help get, uh, get that funding because obviously they make money off of it. The municipality gets more out of it. And, and the money's there for stuff. So that was something interesting that we're gonna be working with them on in addition to the grant writer um, that we're advertising for as well. So hopefully a lot of exciting opportunities. Tommy, did you have any priorities? So I basically, along the same road that you, I said uh, roads and green spaces park area, basically green space in town. And I know Commissioner Lott has said um, youth activities. So I will say that out loud in the meeting for us to add to that list. Um, and she can correct me if I'm wrong after the fact. <laughs> All right. Um, I would like to go on to public comment. I do have a written public comment from Patty Caldicon, but it is on the FY 2022 budget. So I'm not going to read it at this time because it's not related to the topic. Is there anyone with their hand up, Kyle? No public comment, no. Okay. All right, let's move on to codification firms. Exciting stuff. Um, so kudos out, out to John, um, our town clerk. He's the one who uh, reached out um, uh, just to give everyone an idea. A couple of years ago, just prior to the pandemic, uh, the town was actually talking about this and our clerk at the time, Dave Williams, actually reached out to uh, these three firms. And uh, well, actually there's another one, but they merged um, with I think Communicode or General Code. So there was four, now there's only three. Um, about codification, something that the town attorney, that the town's actually been discussing for about 10 years. Um, there was some looking into doing it ourselves. I think um, under present sonnet, a, uh, and attorney best, um, he had attorney best draft a, co a code together, but um, at the time attorney best recommended that they actually get a legal team or one of these firms to, to use the codification 
Um, so pretty much at this time, we're recommending, uh, staff's recommending that the uh, town use some of the ARPA funds um, because since we've seen a lot of stuff shift to virtually, we obviously want our um, codes and regulations to be easily accessible um, by the residents online um, because that's where they're going to our website for a lot of things these days. And right now, the way we have it set up, I don't know if anyone's been there, but when you go in, we have the ordinances broken down by year um, because we really don't have categories for them because each ordinance is its own category for the most part. Um, so it's really hard to find. So pretty much you have to scroll through all these individual PDFs. You can't do a general search. So pretty much what the, uh, these codification firms do, they're legal teams that specialize in taking all the legislation from a town or city and putting, they review it all. They see what has been updated. And if there's stuff that has been updated or deemed irrelevant because of new legislation, they kind of cut that out and they build a searchable online database, a, a codification, a code of it. Um, and there's a lot of examples of those, if anyone's interested in um, of some municipalities in our area using them, the county uses them. Uh, so pretty much um, John reached out and sat through these three companies kind of presentations on what they do. Um, he is recommending Municode. It seems to be the leader of who other municipalities around us in the state use. They also um, came in a little cheaper overall when you look at their annual maintenance fee. Um, and they also have some more stuff included in it than general code. I think we can pretty much rule out board docs. Um, it's kind of what we're looking for, but general code and muni code blow them out of the water um, with what they do. So uh, yeah, and board docs is, it'll be more expensive. You just do the basic math and three years, it's gonna yeah. cost nine grand. So uh, three or four years, it'll already be more expensive than the other two. Um, and Municode, um, if you go, through, we don't wanna go through the whole thing or try and figure it all on the slide, but, and uh, John has everything in, um, that he reviewed, but it really will help us with our meeting packet stuff as well. It helps like with agenda building and it's really an, an all-inclusive thing. So I encourage you to review the, uh, the proposals and the packet and um, just see what they do. But that's where we are. Um, so you just wanna see what, what the board's thoughts were on, what the public's thoughts were on it. Um, this would be federal funding we use um, to do so, so. Yeah, I'm gonna say, um, cause in my former life I was a town planner. And so I frequently access code. Um, and I, when I moved here, I tried to access our code and I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? I can't find anything. Um, so I definitely think we need this. And when I was working, if I went onto a website and it had Municode, I was happy because I knew I was looking at something I could handle. Um, and even now when I access code, if it's Municode, like it just feels more user-friendly to me. That could be personal preference, but given staff is recommending them, <laughs> I personally find them to be user-friendly and they are going to be a much cheaper annual maintenance fee. I, I really kind of agree with the staff recommendation. I don't know what the other commissioners think. Um, I like that you mentioned that it's user-friendly and knowing that you have had some experience with that is really important. Um, and um, I know we all, you know, we all have our, uh, I would say how we best, um, how certain systems best work for us. And um, if it's something that is good that the residents can easily go on and utilize and not take up a lot of their time to look for what they want, um, I think that's definitely a plus. Um, I'm not sure um, in terms of, uh, it sounds like in terms of cost, it just sounds like this would be maybe the better value um, for us as opposed to some of the others that were already looked at and um, the technical side. So from what you just mentioned there, the technical side is a huge benefit. So the ease of use at the best value for the town um, I am totally in agreement with um, Unicode, and um, I would be excited to see this uh, implemented and being able to use it and see uh, that the residents are being able to uh, uh, benefit from this as well and be able to search the things that they need to look into and be more aware about different types of, of codes and so forth. So this is a plus. I like it. 
I forgot to mention that John also said that that their fee can kind of be split over a two year period. Uh, so that is also a nice feature. <laughs> Tommy, do, what do you have to, what are your thoughts? I'm in agreement with both of you actually. From what I read and looked in, you know, a lot of the other towns in the area are using them. Um, Kyle, is that what is that what you're showing us right now? Is that an example? Yeah, yeah I just pulled up. So uh, like City of Laurel. Um, it looks it. really user friendly. Yeah, just, um, yeah. I, I like it. I think it's a great idea. And like you said, Sarah, when you first moved here, and when I first started looking at stuff uh, on the website, it's it needs to be easier. And I think this is the I like the company that we're talking about, the Muni Code. And I think it's a good good thing for the town. And as you can see in, in the upper right hand corner, um, residents can sign up with new codes being put in um, and oh, nice. features. You can download stuff into Word doc or print it or share links and email. Um, and over here, you can see how it's divided up into different chapters. So like police department, there's a whole code on police general mutual aid agreements. Um, and you can, um, they are also able to look at our charter um, and keep our charter updated. That's so it's all a one stop shop. So, pretty much the way it'll set up if, if whoever we go with, pretty much we upload all of our town code, all the ordinances, the resolutions, everything goes up to them and they start sorting through it. It's, it's a uh, that's why it's such a large upfront fee. Um, and then as the town passes new legislation, we send it individually or we send it to them quarterly. Um, so, if it's something important and big, like uh, we do a new property standards maintenance, we probably want to get that into the code pretty quickly. Um, but if it's something like uh, the budget adjustment or something, something that's more administrative that stands on its own, um, we can get to them more on a quarterly basis. Um, so that's how, why that um, annual fees in place, because it's kind of always being updated. It's not a one time yeah. update. And they're reasonable too, um, you know, compared to a couple of the other ones. It'll basically pay for itself if it makes people's job easier. And um, like That's you said, it, for the print packet, Sarah's familiar with it. Um, we have somebody that knows what it's like. And uh, I think it's going to be a good thing. All right. I'm going to, well, Kyle, while you see if there's any public comment, I, I can read the comment from Patty Calcott. I think we've addressed everything. And then there's just a part that I'm not sure what it means. So I'm going to ask her to come back with that at the next meeting, unless Brian knows what it means. Uh, so codification firms, what are the requirements, grant funding available, split between five commissioners, two clerks, town administrator, code enforcement? That's the part I'm not sure about. Um, and I think we addressed the other two. Is there any other public comment? Not at this time. Okay. I have a comment. Oh, I guess we can have staff comment. Long overdue. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. All right. So we'll go to resolution 2022 08 ARPA spending. And I can uh, tag team this with Will Morgan. Um, so pretty much as the, the board approved an ARPA spending plan, um, so in it, um, it broke down 25,000 for each of the three departments for items that we may not have um, put forth in the budget in the past due to the, uh, the COVID and its possible impact on the budget. Like for instance, codification came up prior to COVID and it got cut out of, uh, I think the FY21 uh, budget because we, it was like, uh, let's, let's rein it in a little bit. So now using ARPA funds to kind of get these items back on track. Um, so just split up between general government. These are some of the, the big ticket items. Some stuff is under the 2000 limit that the board can move forward with, but I did list them on here. Um, so I'll just go through general government codification, town ordinance charter around $10,000. Um, as you saw the, um, it's like seven to 8,000 between the two firms we're looking at with the annual fee. So that'll, it'll pretty much come around to $10,000. 
Um, the other big ticket item we're looking to update is the cable access channel to digital. Right now it's an analog and it's not very easy to upgrade. Um, so we're asking to go with a uh, local firm that works with cable access that will be able to switch us and upgrade us to a digital format. Um, that's going to cost around $2,600 for equipment updates. And then um, in the proposal, they also charge $180 per month. Um, but that's something we can discuss if uh, moving forward. Um, out of the general government budget, um, there's some technological purchases that were made such as um, commissioners getting an iPad with uh, access to um, the Verizon data network, and then also some Zoom um, webinar and just general Zoom subscriptions that we pay for. And uh, also the phone system upgrade um, from regular um, Verizon lines to a uh, internet-based hosted system that a lot of places are going to, to allow for um, easier remote work, or if an emergency happens or snowstorm, the government can still kind of operate as normal, even if no one's physically at town hall, we can log into a computer or our cell phones and be able to program the town hall system to, to forward messages and stuff like that. And it also comes out as a cost saving um, because we're paying for um, six Verizon lines right now. And those would pretty much all go away and it would be hosted over the internet, which we already have. So it kind of would pay for itself. Um, that has already been put in motion because it's under the, uh, the 2000, but we just want to bring up, and that's with our existing um, phone system uh, host, uh, McEnroe, who we went with when we built the new town hall and had to buy the new phone system. So they're already moving forward on that. Um, so hopefully in the next 30 days, we'll be seeing those systems up and running. Um, and I can kind of turn it over to, uh, to um, Mr. Bond and Chief Burst to talk about their department's items. Um, where I can talk. I'm not sure if Mr. Bond has his voice back. <laughs> or Will, did I miss anything? Um, no. Okay. I was going to say, I can say what Darnell sorry, has said, ahead. sorry, Director Bond, what Director Bond has said to me is if they're going to purchase a used truck, if they have to wait for us to pass a resolution, by the time we do so, the used truck has been purchased. Um, so I'm thinking that's what he's going to say, but that could be wrong. Yes. <laughs> um, I definitely support um, the idea of passing one resolution instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, set six resolutions. Um, and all I will add is um, um, everything you said, Kyle, was, was, was on point on cue. Uh, a part of this resolution um, was because, or put in, trying to put this forth um, to the board uh, due to the um, Treasury wanting the, the municipalities to be more transparent about the items that they're going to be using, uh, purchasing with the ARPA American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, some, of the, some individuals or other municipalities have just put out kind of like a broad thing of saying, hey, we're going to use this for uh, um, public works expenses and, and really not giving more details. So uh, some people were getting, or sorry, some not people, some municipalities were getting slapped on a wrist from Treasury saying that you have to back, um, redo a resolution or ordinance or things like that of the spending uh, for the fund. So uh, we're trying to make sure that we have to avoid, we, that we're able to avoid that conversation. And this is um, only for $75,000 of the uh, $650,000 in ARPA funds that Pat received. So that's, this isn't all the ARPA funds. I just want to highlight that as well, because I realize that's not highlight. This is just the 25000 per department that was put in for this fiscal year as part of the, uh, the ARPA spending plan. Um, Do um, Chief First, do you have anything? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, as you see, our things are listed there on the on the screen. I know that Motorola Police Radio may be a sticker shop to many, but um, that's just that's what it costs. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can get it cheaper, but that is the quote that came from the vendor um, that was given to everybody in the municipality, and unfortunately, that's just the cost that we have to pay um, for a radio. Um, the radio is encrypted. It has multiple channels. You can talk to every agency in Prince George's County, um, as well as DC, 
Um, and some people may say, why do we need that? Well, if something happens here in the town, there's an event, there's a mass event. If we had to go to another area, we could talk um, not just with Prince George's County Office, but with Maryland Park, uh, Anne Arundel County, Montgomery County, all of that stuff. So that's just the nature of the cost of it. Everything else that we need is probably under the $2,000 um, um, requirement, but this one radio is, and that's just one radio. So if anybody's asking, yes, that's for one radio. That's it. That's for that's car painful. radio. <laughs> well, that's that's <laughs> one radio, but as we add officers, that number is going to, can you know, it's going to multiply per officer. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's probably going to be here within the next six months. That's the other challenge. So even if I, I've already ordered it, but they told me it may not be here for six months. So I should order another one just because it may not be here for a year. So, mm -hmm. um, but I'm just ordering the one for now. So you may have a public comment after that. <laughs> it's not a radio for listening to tunes people, but yes, um, I'm gonna take commissioner's comments before we go to public. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, just the follow-up, yes. Not for listening to tunes, of course. <laughs> and um, since that is probably something that's going to be, you know, commented about, um, I, I will say, it, in light of us looking into annexation, you know, and moving forward, these are things that we're going to need to invest in anyway. We need it now. We're going to need it in the future. And obviously, we're going to need another one in the future. So, this is something that we need to know, like these are things that are very, you know, they're costly. And this is why we need to look into being able to continue to move forward with our annexation because we need to be able to provide all of these types of, of uh, additional accoutrements that our different departments need to service the, uh, our local community, as well as those that are hopefully and potentially gonna be annexed in. So, um, these are needed, much needed items um, to keep the town um, working and um, operational um, on every side. So, um, uh, you know, responsible budgeting, and, and, and I see it being done here. I always like what you say, Janice. Go ahead, Tommy. Um, I I think if, uh, if anyone had the concern that, you know, we might not read it right now, like it was said, we are going to need it in the future. And just like everything else, costs are going to go up. So I'm not against, you know, getting it now. I think it's a smart idea. All right. So Kyle, do we have public comment? Not at this time, no, ma'am. Okay. All right, so we can move on to the intern program. And I can uh, talk about this as well. So um, back in 2019, pre-pandemic, um, I know it's hard to think back that far, um, but the town hosted an internship program. Uh, we partnered with the Prince George County Keys, um, Knowledge Equals Youth Success, um, to have four interns over the summer. We had, I believe, one at Public Works, one in police and then two for general government. Um, and so that was really beneficial. Um, there were a lot of help doing, I mean, it was great when we had mailers because as you can see in that one picture, we had a, a, a mailing chain going, um, everyone helping mail mailers. Um, but I know Darnell had someone riding around. He was teaching them how to use the equipment um, and just different functions that town government does. They are paid by um, employee Prince George's. So they, they gather all these, um, uh, youths between ages uh, 18 and 25, uh, fresh out of high school, um, not currently in college or possibly currently in college, um, and connect them with their different, um, these different programs like us, where the, um, we have mentors on site and the print insurers can't, employ print insurers actually paid them the small fee. So it was free to the town, but we were the ones giving them um, kind of that learning environment and a space to learn about municipal government. Uh, so we had them do a bunch of different projects. They did an audit of the website. Um, they helped develop some social media stuff. Um, and uh, so it was really good. So now uh, pandemic's kind of winding down, we hope. 
So we're looking for this upcoming summer, possibly host some additional interns again. Um, this could be a mix of pulling from the keys program, which is countywide. We could also put it out for town um, interns uh, or put preference out there for, for town and more local uh, people to come on board. Um, and I can ask the keys program if they can kind of set the preference. So if we know of any uh, town residents or younger town residents who want to intern, they can just apply for the keys program and they can get assigned to us type of deal. Um, but I just want to put it out there, see what, see what the board thought. Of course, it's all, if we get another spike in COVID and stuff like that, we'll have to reevaluate. Um, but as we look to reopen town hall here in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully, um, which would be another, another step and just introduce some youth to municipal government. Um, I, I love the idea of interns. I love the idea of new fresh ideas and um, you know, just working with, with young people and helping them get themselves going um, while helping the town. I did have one question, which was if we didn't go through the keys program, how would we fund? Like how, how I guess this is a, like, you may not know this, but like, how much do they get paid through keys? Um, because we would need to consider whether we wanted to fund that and how many positions we wanted to fund. I could find out it wasn't a lot of money. Um, I'm pretty sure it was like <laughs> close to minimum wage type deal. Um, yeah. All right, less, yeah, less than $15 an hour. Um, but I like a stipend. Yeah, yeah, more of a stipend. Um, and we don't have to pay if someone really just wants the experience, but of course <laughs> we can't. We'd have to pay everyone or no one. I would recommend. <laughs> I, that's what. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, uh, I think everyone should be receiving the same. Whether we, if we do, if we do a mix, we need to make sure everyone's receiving the same stipend. Well, and the I, and I really, internship. Sorry. Yeah. Paid internship. Yeah. I just. I mean, they're getting a lot of knowledge from us and that is costing us something, but they also are giving us something. <laughs> so. Commissioner Duckett, what do you think? Um, yeah, of course, uh, I'm always for an internal program. I think that's the way to, uh, to get our future leaders involved with government and uh, having them, of course, come to the town of Oakland Marlboro would be great. Um, and then hopefully they can talk to their parents about government and, you know, coming out to some of those events that we have and supporting us on many sides. So um, I love to see that. I think that um, I worked for the American Red Cross for many years and that was one of the things that um, we did was to actually target the youth for swimming classes because we know once they learn how to swim they would always come back and bring their children to learn how to swim as well so and get them started early so um this is just going to be a win-win i think for the town um and to see how town really operates and to be able to take that information back into the classroom um this is going to be great for the students and i hopefully great for the town and I can't think of a better staff to work under. So uh, <laughs> these students will really have a good time. Well said, Janice. Um, I just got a message from our town clerk that the town cannot run two Zoom meetings at the same time. Um, so we are at the end of our agenda. I do want, if public has their hands up, let's give them a chance to comment. Does anyone have their hand up, Kyle? Not okay. this time, Mayor. Mm -hmm. So we're going to wrap this up real quick so that they can put the vote count on. So we're getting ready to go into closed session to discuss the current annexation, which is in a legal limbo, as we said. So I'm going to just read this. Um, let's see. Under general provision, article 3-305B1 to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, Promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction. Any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. To consult with staff, consultants, and other individuals about pending or potential litigation. Under these articles of the Maryland's Open Meeting Act, I propose that we go into closed 
session. Do I have a, I'm sorry, is there a motion for us to go into closed session under these provisions? Yes, so moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are officially in closed session, which we are going to hold up at town hall. So we're gonna hop off this so that John can start broadcasting the vote count, everyone. Okay, thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. I'll pick you up in a minute. All right, see you in a minute. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.